Yes, please hold all questions about the unhealthiness of eating vegetables for after. Hey, thank you all for being here. Can you hear me fine? Okay. Um, feel free to shout out questions if, uh, if you get confused in the middle. And I'm also saving plenty of time at the end for questions. Because Zcash is a fully fledged uh, thing in operation in, in the wild right now, and and that means there's a lot of there's a lot to it. There's a lot of interesting different angles on what's on what's going on. Um, so you can ask about all that stuff, whatever you're interested in. Uh, this is supposed to be the basic concept and basic intro to the science. Okay, so blockchains give us something really interesting, which to my way of thinking about it, this may be somewhat fuzzy or it may be correct, I don't know, but the, basically what I think is that blockchains give us the append-only property and the canonical property. The append-only property means you can't go back and change your story later. And the canonical property means you can't tell different, two different stories to two different people using one blockchain. And, uh, and there's something else much, much older, because the whole concept of blockchain is, is brand new, and it was a, a revelation when, this, when, when it turned out to work, um, when Satoshi published it, well, and then when it worked. Well, but for a long time, we've understood encryption, um, but there are two properties of encryption. One is that you can exclude the man in the middle um, from eavesdropping on your data, but the other is that you get selective disclosure. So the first one's I would call confidentiality between two parties. But the second property that encryption gives you is selective disclosure. If you're using encryption to per control access to data, then that means there's a small string that is sufficient to give someone access to that data, which is the decryption key. And uh, as far as the mathematics is concerned, you can share that decryption key with someone in order to give that person, but not other people, access to the data. So that's what I call selective disclosure, and that's a property that just the mathematics of encryption provides. Well, until Zcash, you couldn't, or at least no one had, <laughs> put those two properties together so that you can have confidential and selectively disclosable things that also have the append only and canonical property all put together. And in order to do that, it relied on um, the development of sufficiently uh, fast, efficient enough zero-knowledge proofs. So Bitcoin is actually just an Excel spreadsheet with three, four columns. And whenever, uh, whenever you want to append a row to the Bitcoin spreadsheet, the miners and full nodes and the recipient want to see if this row is correct, if this is a valid transaction to add to the ledger. And the way they do that is they review all of history and figure out, based on all of the previous transactions, they can tell that address C previously received some Bitcoin and hasn't previously given it to anyone else. Therefore, it's legit for address C to give it to address D now. A really neat thing about, so Bitcoin was a great revelation, but a really interesting thing about it is that it, it kind of only uses like two concepts from cryptography, secure hash functions and digital signatures. Um, almost everything in the whole internet is just based on secure hash functions, symmetric encryption, public key encryption, and digital signatures. Um, and it's interesting that there's, there's this vast, uh, intellectual landscape of other ideas in cryptography, almost all of which have never been used for anything, as far as I know. Um, so I'm really pleased and excited about Zcash being the first use of one of those for anything, uh, at least the first use that I'm really aware of. But the question is, why didn't Satoshi, so Satoshi valued privacy a lot. Like me, I guess I should throw in, why am I even doing all this? It's, uh, it's, it's mostly because I really value privacy. I think it's a social good that strengthens and protects and uplifts societies. And I think it's a human right. 
that's necessary for the exercise of your political rights, for free freedom of speech, free thought, um, for the exercise of moral choices. I think privacy is really, really important. I also think it's necessary for business. This kind of radical transparency that Bitcoin has is cool and interesting. Um, the append only and the canonical properties are what I think are the most powerful bits. Bitcoin also has the third property of radical transparency. Um, but I think that's incompatible with most business uses. Al almost all cases that anyone either as a consumer or an individual or as a business or as a government or, or any use of a database, al almost all uses of databases require selective disclosure of the contents to some parties but not others. So anyway, that's why we started on all this is because we love and value privacy, but we also think it's necessary for the maintenance of a modern economy. So, but Satoshi also did. He also valued privacy, uh, and he talked about these topics and said, oh, it's too bad we can't encrypt this stuff in order to present it only, make it accessible only to the authorized parties. Um, but if we did, how would the validators and miners uh, test whether a newly added transaction is valid and, and uh, fits into the, into the ledger. So that's where zero knowledge proofs came in because they didn't have sufficiently fast zero knowledge proofs back when, when Satoshi was originally working. Uh, but since then, we've come up with, we meaning science, has come up with sufficiently fast zero knowledge proofs and with them, you can add a, a fifth column to your spreadsheet, and that's Zcash. So now, in Zcash, we use normal old encryption. Um, you know, well understood, high quality, symmetric encryption uh, to protect the contents of all of sender, recipient, and value transferred. And then, every transaction comes with a fourth thing, which is the proof that the encrypted stuff is valid. Which, so feel free to start raising your hands and saying what the heck, because this, this part gets really weird, at least for me. Um, how can you prove, <laughs> what, I, what I'm claiming is that when you're a, a Zcash miner and you receive this transaction, it says an undisclosed party is transmitting an undisclosed amount of Zcash to another undisclosed party, and here's a proof that this doesn't violate any of the constraints of the system. It doesn't create money out of thin air. Nobody can double spend. It totally satisfies all the integrity constraints of the database. And here's a proof of that. <laughs> okay, so zero knowledge proofs but hopefully by the end of today, we will all understand them better because people who understand them better than I are going to give lectures on them. Um, but my conception of zero knowledge proofs is take an arbitrary computer program and with the modern efficient zero knowledge proofs called SNARKs or maybe other things, you can prove, with, with the modern efficient zero knowledge proofs, you can prove that a certain string is the output of this arbitrary computer program without revealing anything about the inputs. Yes? Doesn't it just mean that whatever process you went to do the encryption, it's not invertible? Meaning, just by the property of, invert of non-invertibility, yeah. it guarantees that. Everything. The question is, it doesn't this, isn't non-invertibility already sufficient to guarantee that? And the answer is, it, that, that is definitely related for concealing the inputs, okay? It's, it's, easy to, it's easy to conceal the inputs. Um, the weird mind-boggling thing that zero knowledge proofs give us is that you can be satisfied that the creator of this string must have known some inputs that satisfy the, that produce this output of your program. And you can uh, prove that, you can, you can be persuaded of that without learning anything about the inputs. So let me show how we use this to achieve this in Zcash. This is, like I say, the first use of zero knowledge proofs that actually mattered for anything in my knowledge. Yes? Could you maybe then say that it's invertible, but only with respect to one fact? Oh, right, that's an interesting, the question was, can you say that it's invertible, but only with respect to one fact? 
Like, yeah, right. So if you look at this proof, you do learn something. You learn that some sender had enough to send some amount to some other recipient. So <laughs> there's a little bit more to it. This is a little bit of an oversimplified slide. Uh, on the next slide, it gets a lot more complicated. Um, OK, so I'm going to show you. All right, so hopefully you, either you already knew all this and you're just waiting for the next slide, or you, like me, are sort of amazed that this is even possible and wondering if this really works. Yeah, like when Bitcoin came out, I read the paper, like a lot of people. Go. The thing that kind of bothers me is how long back do I have to go for, to, to be confident that the last transaction is valid? In this one? In, in Bitcoin? In both. Okay. In Bitcoin, you have to look all the way back to the beginning of history, basically. Like you can, there are some optimizations, but in principle, someone could say, I'm here to spend this money, and you might start searching back to see where they got it. And you might have to go back to the beginning to the Genesis block to find out, oh, that's where they got it. Now I can see that, it's, that they're the legitimate owner of it. But there's optimizations available. Um, in this one, it's really weird. <laughs> uh, but, but, but to some degree, you can be satisfied they've, they've come up with this cryptographic proof, which they couldn't have done cryptographically if they didn't control some unspent money, which you'll see more on the next slide. So when the Bitcoin white paper came out, or the original Bitcoin paper came out, uh, like a lot of people, I read it and thought, oh, yeah, this will never work. That was a nice try. Th thanks for adding this to our collection of failed attempts, oh, Satoshi. And then like a year or two later, I noticed that it, uh, people were actually using it. So that's when I started getting interested. Um, similarly, uh, zero knowledge proofs have been around forever, but they're pretty hard for me to even conceptualize. But Zcash has been around for a whole year now, and it's still working, so that's encouraging. Yes? Uh, this is the proof, but what, what is the model? OK. That's the next slide. Here we go. Um, this is copied from the zero cash uh, paper by a bunch of scientists. Um, this is the program that we're going to prove we, we have a correct output of in order to prove zero cash. In order, to, in order to prove that you, you had some money and you hereby are giving it to someone else. OK. Um, for starters, look at this thing over here. It's a Merkle tree. Everybody in public on the, Z, on the Zcash network knows some root of a Merkle tree. And the leaves of this Merkle tree are what we call commitments. And this is the set of all the valid coins that have ever existed. This is the set of all the valid coins. So the secret is going to be, in, in order to transfer, to, in order to spend a coin, what we need to do is prove that we're the, the owner of the coin who knows the, the secret key to, the, to one coin without revealing which coin we own. That's, that's how to do privacy and spend, spend money. Now, this is the structure of a coin. This here is your secret key. It also gets used here. This is ASK. Can you read this? ASK is your secret key that gives you the ability to spend one coin. Uh, this is how much value the coin bears. Actually, in the modern Zcash papers and documentation, we don't call them coins anymore because it's not a fixed value like a 10 shekel coin. It's, uh, you can put any arbitrary value onto one of them. So we call them notes instead of coins. But this is copied from the original paper, so I'll call them coins. Um, so, so this is your secret key. This is the public key that identifies this secret key. <laughs> and this is the value of this particular note. So this proof here is a proof that whoever generated this ciphertext, they know some secret key that's not being revealed, which, when hashed this way and this way and this way with the value, produces a commitment. But the commitment's not being revealed. And that undisclosed commitment fits into the Merkle tree, and when hashed with a bunch of, of uh, uncles, it hashes to the root, and that is revealed. 
So it's a proof that I know a secret which controls one of the coins in the Merkle tree, which hashes to the universally acknowledged root, uh, uh, which identifies the set of all coins. Okay, so that, that proves that I know, one of, I know the secret of one of the coins, but it doesn't reveal which coin. Now we have to do a bunch more work uh, because this proves that I know the secret for one of the coins, um, but we also make sure that I haven't spent it before and we want to give my recipient a fresh coin so they can spend it. Okay, so now we have a bunch more additions we need to add. Um, but we just, just wait. How many people are totally lost? Do you get that so far? Some people are totally lost? Half? A third of the people are totally lost? Okay. What? A third of the people are half lost. Great. Um, Thank you, thank you for being willing to say that. Good, thank you. Not, not waste a bunch of time carrying on, just right. All right, so. Yeah, this is a really complicated slide. Um, these arrows are almost all hash functions, really, basically. It's kind of cool how far, like, almost everything is just built out of hash functions, including Bitcoin and this. Um, anyway, so. <laughs> So there's, there's two confusing concepts that we're trying to bring together here. One is this structure and why it achieves what we want to achieve. The other is zero knowledge proofs and what they even are. So which part are you confused about? <laughs> Both? OK, so with the zero knowledge proof, let me see just one more time. I don't understand zero knowledge proofs very well. I'm going to understand them better by the end of today, as will you. Um, but with them, we can prove that, I can give you a proof that I know something which when you run it through a circuit or a chain of computation, it produces a certain output. So, so the two important factors of a zero knowledge proof are first of all, it doesn't reveal the input like we talked about earlier. Uh, because the input is my secret key that controls the coin. Also, the important factor is that I can prove to you I must have known this thing. I must have known such a secret. The difference between zero-knowledge proofs and all other sorts of cryptography, like encryption and other stuff, is, to my mind, again, this is maybe is a overgeneralization, but to my mind, the important difference about it is its, is its generality. We're going to use the zero knowledge proof as a, as a general purpose black box. And then we designed, we designed this whole circuit and just said, we're going to stick this circuit into a zero knowledge proof. So the circuit doesn't involve any, there's no zero knowledge proof on this slide. OK? This is just a bunch, every arrow is just a secure hash function, pretty much, unless I'm overlooking something. But I think every one of these arrows is just a secure hash function. and. Uh, and this is just a secret key. So if you have a lot of time, by secret key, I mean this is just a random number, actually. Uh, so I, I like this, because for me, secure hash functions I do understand pretty well, and random secret numbers I do understand pretty well. So given enough time, you can study this, and, and given your understanding of secure hash functions and random numbers, you can understand this. However, we're going to move on, and then maybe we can come back to it. I think, have I already been going for 20 minutes? Oh my god. OK. We have lots to talk about. OK, so given zero knowledge proof, secure hash functions, random numbers, I can prove that I knew a, a secret which what, a, a secret whose commitment was registered in this tree, the set of all known coins. Along the way, there's this other output, which is called the serial number. And this is how we're going to prevent double spends. Because um, the serial number is, is determined by the secret key. So 
I can't, I can't, I can't prove anything about this coin without uh, that being deterministically resulting in the same serial number every time. So the serial number and the commitment, can't, you can't change them. You can't have a different commitment with the same serial number or a different serial number with the same commitment. They're always the same as each other. But, or they're always linked. You can't change either of them, but uh, someone who doesn't know the secret cannot tell that they're related. Okay, because this is, these are secure hash functions which have as an input a secret number that you're not telling anyone. You, the owner of the coin, are not telling anyone. So nobody other than the owner of the coin knows that this commitment and this serial number come from the same coin. Yes? Do they know Rho? No. Uh, I don't remember who knows Rho, but it doesn't matter because only the owner of the coin knows ASK. I think just the, the giver and the receiver of the coin are the only two people who know Rho. Um, OK, so this, this, this is important because to prevent double spins, we're going to reveal the serial number to the public. So when I'm going to spin my coin, I prove not only that my coin exists in the set of all coins that have ever been created, but I also prove that this is the serial number of my coin. And doing that doesn't reveal, uh, so I reveal the serial number. All right, I reveal which set the coin lives in, and I reveal the serial number of my now spent coin, but I never reveal when I'm spending the, the commitment of the coin, because that would, that would allow you to see the connection between the coin I'm spending and where I got it. Okay. <laughs> All right, here's a neat thing. Here's a neat thing about this architecture. I'm really excited about this because what we've done is composed encryption with zero knowledge proofs. And encryption and zero knowledge proofs are two very flexible general purpose tools. So we're working with uh, JP Morgan, the world's most valuable bank, to apply the same kind of technology to enterprise blockchains. And these are the typical requirements let me back up so you're not reading and you're listening again. Um, it was really fun when we started this project. There was this kind of libertarian narrative that Bitcoin was the you know, disruptive underdog or whatever. And, uh, and, and that's me. I'm a libertarian, and I like disrupting things, and I'm an underdog. Uh, but um, it was really fun when we discovered shortly into it that giant banks and governments and things like that are uh, some of our best customers because they require privacy and they're very demanding about it. Um, whereas consumers, I think they value privacy a lot, but they're, it's a lot more complicated and hard to tell what they mean by that. Um, but as soon as we were working with this bank, uh, one of the hard requirements that they have for selling their enterprise blockchain to other banks or whatever is that you have to be able to control disclosure of data in specific ways. This is an example where if you were using a blockchain to trade assets between, say, banks in a, in a banking consortium closed blockchain or something, uh, you might need to reveal some of the elements from each transaction to a certain party. There are market data aggregators are one of those things that um, and you might need to reveal all of the data from some transactions to the counterparties and to regulators and things like that. Uh, but it's a hard requirement that you can't reveal anything about the transaction to your competitors in the market, which is also the other banks operating the same blockchain. And a really neat thing about this architecture is that encryption, we know how to use encryption to encrypt some things and not others or to encrypt some of the things under one key and some of the things under another key or whatever. It's a very flexible tool. And likewise with zero knowledge proofs, it's a very general flexible tool. So it's relatively easy to fit these requirements, to, to implement these requirements with encryption plus zero knowledge proofs. So Zcash as it exists today, we launched an open public blockchain cryptocurrency a year ago. And it's super successful and exciting and is used all around the world. And uh, Oh, you can't see this, but there's little blue dots that you can't see because it's too bright in here. But there are blue dots all around the world of people running Zcash nodes. And um, 
One decision we made in Zcash was, shall we, so we started by cloning Bitcoin. And then we had the decision, we've, we've cloned Bitcoin and we've added this encrypted, these encrypted transactions. Shall we now remove the unencrypted transactions that Bitcoin came with, or shall we keep them? We decided to keep them for ease of onboarding so that people can easily add Zcash functionality into their uh, wallets and businesses and exchanges and tools. And that leads to an interesting situation where, uh, which you will see later today in a live demo, where um, there are two kinds of addresses on the Zcash blockchain, which we call shielded addresses and transparent addresses. And you can spend money to, from any combination to any combination of shielded and transparent addresses. And then, and there's conservation of money, so you can't create any, regardless of to what type of address you're sending it. And um, then the protocol, the, the encryption that we just described, hides from the unauthorized viewer as much information as it can hide, considering that the amount of money owned by a transparent address is always visible on the blockchain. So if you, if you send from one shielded address and one transparent address 10 Zcash, and you sent five, you could send an unknown amount of Zcash from a shielded address and also send 10 Zcash from the transparent address in a single <laughs> transaction. And you could deliver five of that Zcash, or you could deliver 15 of that Zcash to a transparent address and the rest to the shielded address. And anyone looking at the blockchain would be able to deduce certain things. So if you sent 10 from here and an unknown amount from here, and you delivered 15 to here and an unknown amount to there, you could deduce that there must have been at least five in here originally. But you don't know, that's just a lower bound. You don't know what else. You can't get any more information than what is deducible from the public information. So that's the current state of affairs. Oh, and there's an important detail up here. Every such encrypted transaction comes with an encrypted memo field, which is like the shield, the, the, the field on a check. I don't know if you people even know what paper checks are. Do they use paper checks here? Young people don't know what paper checks are. But anyway, there's a memo on a check that you can write in so that the sender and receiver can remember what this payment was for. And we have one of those that's, um, that's encrypted and put into the blockchain. Uh, and that's another case of this neat combination of blockchains plus encryption put together, which is um, encrypted love notes in the Zcash blockchain. So a little while ago, a young woman of my acquaintance told me that she had received a, a Zcash payment of a small amount. And in the memo field that came with it, there was a link to a file in a distributed file system. So she followed the link and loaded the file, and it was tickets to this international event that she and her boyfriend had been talking about going to. So it's a love note, which is uh, immutably hidden inside the Zcash blockchain, and no one's ever seen it but the two parties who are privy to it. Encrypted love notes in the blockchain. It's a real thing that already exists. You remember that next time somebody's saying, what are blockchains good for? I, don't know. I, guess, I guess that guy scored points. Okay, we only have five minutes, and then we have lots of time for questions. All right. Last thing. There's this terrible flaw in the efficient zero-knowledge proofs. Uh, so we use them because it's the only way that I know of to, achieve, to, to be able to use encryption strength privacy in a blockchain. There are other kinds of privacy in a blockchain which I, I don't think are uh, nearly as strong as good old-fashioned encryption is. Uh, but to use good old-fashioned encryption, the only way I could figure out how to do it was to use the new efficient zero-knowledge proofs. But the new efficient zero-knowledge proofs have this terrible issue, which is that everybody involved needs, the, the, 
the, the provers who are spending money and the validators that are validating transactions in the blockchain, uh, to validate the zero knowledge proofs, they need to use this, basically this public key, which we call the, the public parameters of the ZK snark. And those public parameters have this form, some generator to the tau. And if you knew tau, you could forge money. <laughs> because uh, anybody who knows the secret part, the trapdoor of the snark parameters can make proofs of falsehoods, pr proofs that will be accepted by a verifier, um, but they don't know the actual inputs to the program that produce that output. So this is a terrible, terrible fatal flaw. So in order to go ahead and deploy this while being sufficiently, so there's, a, so there's a, a pretty simple thing you could do, which is ask somebody to generate g to the tau for you, ask them to forget tau, and then you, everyone could use that for your, for your cryptocurrency. But if they didn't forget tau, like if someone else hacked into them and stole a copy of tau while they were doing it, that person can forge money. So we came up with a, a multi-party computation to generate g to the tau without anybody ever knowing tau. So instead, we have g to the combination of factors. And we have a multi-party computation where each party knows only their own factor, which is not sufficient to forge money. And they never know the other people's factors, and then they all delete their factors before the, at the end of the ceremony. And that produces g to the tau that now everyone is using. So Zcash has got like, I think half a billion dollars worth of value. If, if you take the total number of Zcash coins that exist times the current price of Zcash coins, that equals half a billion dollars. And uh, this is what we're all relying on. So in order to generate this, we did this ceremony which I humbly think may be the strongest, most sophisticated cryptographic ceremony that's ever been performed, at least the only that I've ever heard of in the public literature, um, in which we did this multi-party computation, and the machines that were doing the exponentiation to, to generate the numbers were air-gapped, so they had never, we, <laughs> the participants all went to a random computer store and bought a random computer off the shelf and, and like took it home and didn't allow the salesman to take it out of sight or whatever and opened the computer and took the ethernet or sorry the uh, wi-fi chips out so it had no radios so it was it was air gapped from from before it was first used uh, until after until it was destroyed at the end of the ceremony and so we had several of these computers that were kept like that and then we used them to generate these different components, and it produced this thing at the end, and each person creatively destroyed their, their copy of their factor uh, at the end. And there's some more defensive techniques we also used in this ceremony, but those are the most important two. Okay, we're out of time for talking, for me lecturing, but plenty of time for questions. And this is how you can find out more and get our source code and all kinds of stuff. You. Oh, wait. Oh. Just a moment. Thank you. I'm curious about the tau generation process. If each of the computers conducted tau, or is there one like computer that pops a pyramid that all the factors are tau? That's a good question. So the Tau, well, we call it the toxic waste because it's a byproduct of the, of the thing we're trying to produce and it's dangerous. And we call these, the factors, we call them the toxic waste precursors. And so the toxic waste can never come into existence unless all the precursors get mixed together in the same place at the same time, okay? And the precursors never came together ever if for any length of time anywhere, all right? So we, we, we passed data from one air gap computer to the next, and then each of them 
produced the public output g to the tau, but none of them ever had tau. That's, that's the yet another mind-boggling thing, multi-party computation. I don't even understand how it works. But the good question, um, we chatted with each other while we're doing it, and the, the way we transmitted data in and out of the compute nodes was by append-only DVDs, so that we have a, um, yeah, so that, uh, each of the participants in this system now have a stack of DVDs, which are the immutable evidence of exactly what happened. Oh, that's a really good question. Um, there's a lot. So I'm totally dissatisfied with this. This is awesome. It's the best cryptographic ceremony ever, I think. Um, I'm very sure that nobody could have hacked into all six of these air-gapped computers and stolen the precursors and put together a uh, towel, but it's still not good enough. For one thing, you don't know that I'm not lying about all this, right? This all could have been a, a, a uh, a circus act, and actually we could have gotten together beforehand and collected our six pieces uh, in order to have the toxic waste. So the best future work for my purposes would be to find new mathematics, which are maybe on the horizon, I hope, which allow this kind of zero knowledge proofs of arbitrary stuff that's sufficiently efficient, but that the math in it doesn't have this trapdoor anywhere. That would be my favorite thing. And that's all. Ellie calls transparent. They both start with a T, so transparent zero knowledge. Thank you. Thank you.